from the magnificent Midwest. This is the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week when we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives regarding men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. This program is brought to you in part by Let's Get Real, where forensic accountant Tiffany Couch uses her financial skills to shine the light on the real issues we all face every day. If you would like to make decisions based on facts and information rather than on rhetoric and cultural pressure, go to letsgetreallife.com, a place where you can find tools to improve your communication skills and to increase your connection to humanity. That's letsgetreallife.com. Today on the show, we're going to talk with best-selling author Dr. Les Parrott about his book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. But first, a few quick announcements. The audio version of How to Be a Wife is now available. So just go to SuzanneVenker.com slash shop. SuzanneVenker.com slash shop. And you can find um, the, both the ebook and the audio version of How to Be a Wife there. Also, don't forget to become a Patreon supporter. Just go to the SuzanneVenkerShow.com and click on Become a Patron button, where you'll find four very economical levels as well as free gifts just for signing up. And if you have a business you want to promote, there's even an option for that. And speaking of Patreon supporters, a quick shout out to Carolyn, my most recent supporter. So appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Finally, if you're looking for marriage and relationship coaching, just go to SuzanneVenker.com to sign up for your free 30-minute discovery call. Is marriage a crapshoot? My guest today says no. He argues that couples who take a proactive approach to marriage have the best chance at having the most successful relationships. His name is Les Parrott, and he's a clinical psychologist specializing in marriage and family. He, along with his wife, Leslie, who's also a marriage therapist, wrote Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, Seven Questions to Ask Before and After You Marry. Les and I are going to discuss how a person knows if he or she is ready for marriage, the myths people have about marriage that set them up for disappointment, and the five attitudes young people have about marriage that speak volumes about how the future success, about the future success of their own marriages. We will also discuss the common traits of happily married couples. While our conversation is geared toward engaged couples or newlyweds, even if you've been married a long time, there are definite takeaways in this podcast that you do not want to miss. Hey, everyone, just a quick note that the first few minutes, maybe not that long, of this interview got got deleted somehow. So in case you're trying to rewind, wondering what happened to the opening when when I brought Les on, it, it just doesn't exist. I apologize for that. Technical error. Um, that's it. Just wanted to make you aware of that. Welcome to the show, Les. Nobody ever arrives, right? Nobody ever gets to a place where they go, hey, I can check that off my to-do list. I'm totally healthy now, right? Uh, we're all in process. But a relationship can only be as healthy as the least healthy person in it. And so uh, we focus a lot on that at the beginning, you know, with this book, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, and, and we teach college classes on this whole idea. And we have a, a, a single sentence that we feel like is so critical to this whole endeavor. And that is that your relationship can only be as healthy as you are, right? Your relationship can only be as healthy as you are. So therefore, one of the most important things you can do for your marriage, uh, and this goes for whether you're launching lifelong love on the front end or you've enjoyed decades of marriage, one of the most important things you can do for the relationship is work on who you are in the context of it. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. And I get it. And I agree with you. And here's my question, though. I, I think a lot of people might ask, so, okay, what do you do about the fact that A, you can't control how healthy the person you're with is, right? You can only control your own self. And then on the other end of that is that there are a hell of a lot of broken people sort of walking around right now, and they don't even necessarily realize what they're bringing to the table until after they've been married for some time. So what do you, how do you, what is your reaction to that or your response to how to f face that once you've been married? Because oftentimes it's like you're, to get married is to have a mirror put in front of your face. And until you, you know, and until you are married, you often just don't know what those issues are. So what do you do or what do you tell the people who they're working on themselves, but their spouse isn't? 
Right. Well, let's let's begin with uh, what we know for sure, and that is that nobody ever arrives, right? Nobody is ever completely whole. We're all in process. Uh, we all have deficits and we all have strengths. And uh, it's a lack of awareness that can often drive those deficits into an area that becomes very problematic for, for couples as they, they begin to uh, get together. And so that's why we say a relationship of any kind, but certainly a marriage, a relationship can only be as healthy as the least healthy person in it. So I completely agree with you. And it's a matter of awareness, right? You can't do anything about a deficit unless you're aware of it. And so that's one of the keys to personal growth is just understand, oh yeah, uh, okay, I see that now, right? Uh, I can't do anything about it until I recognize it, until I look in the mirror and go, oh yeah, I got the smudge on my face, now I can do something about it. Um, we, we sometimes, when we're teaching our students, we sometimes wrap it up in this, this single sentence. If you try to build intimacy with another person before you've done the difficult work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships, that includes marriage, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. Let me say that one more time. If you try to build intimacy, if you try to build a connection, if you try to build a marriage with somebody else, before you've done the difficult work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself and they'll fall flat. Now, there needs to be a big qualifier in there. And that is that nobody is whole. Nobody ever arrives, right? Nobody wakes up and goes, well, I guess this is the day. I'm totally complete. I'm totally whole, you know? Uh, we're always in process on that. But it's a, it's, there's, there's gradations of that. And so if you have a person that is, is stuck in their, in their process of personal growth, um, and they have a lack of awareness about that, I can promise you they're going to have difficulties in all their relationships, not just their marriage. And so that's why we say a marriage can only be as healthy as the least healthy person in it. Make sense? Does make sense. And really quickly, before I ask you the next question, you, you and your wife, you work together on a daily basis. I, I introduced this at the opening, but your wife, whose name is also Leslie, and she's a therapist as well, you right. both speak together. Um, when you go and you go to speak to who exactly? Yeah, Your so uh, I'm a I'm a clinical psychologist and Leslie's a marriage and family therapist and and yes, it is weird. We have the exact same name, um, and I'm the third, which makes our lives even more complex because my dad, my grandfather, and my wife. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so it's uh it makes uh, opening up Christmas presents always exciting, uh, but um, the 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 the. Uh, relationship that Leslie and I have, she, she comes from a family systems kind of perspective, and I come from a clinical psychology perspective, and so it adds kind of this nice um, kind of melding of mm -hmm. uh, two helping professions within the same lane, and that's why we look at it systemically uh, as well as from just a clinical perspective of, of psychology. Am I answering your question? Remind me what you asked me. Yeah, just, to th well, I asked you specifically about speaking, who your audience is when you, the two oh. of you speak together. Is it, are you uh, with young people? Are you with, you know, just who's the, yeah, who the so audience? Yeah, and I, we've been married uh, a little over 30 years and, um, and we dated for six years before we got married. So we've known each other a long, long time, dated starting in our teen years and uh, got married right after college and then went to graduate school together. And uh, so we, um, um, you know, do our work with um, not just counseling, but we do a lot of public speaking and, and as many as, man, in some years we've done as many as 35, 40 live events uh, around the country and literally around the world. And uh, one of the most popular ones that we do these days, um, at least before we are, we're all homebound with the pandemic, mm -hmm. is uh, some that we call fight night. And uh, how a couple manages conflict is such a huge predictor of success uh, based on John Gottman's research yep. and others that uh, we, we devote a whole event to that and try to have some fun. So our events are always partly entertainment and we squeeze in, uh, you know, some, in, in some, some information, <laughs> exactly, the, the, the pill easier to swallow for couples. But uh, yeah, conflict is, is a big one on fight night. And uh, we do a day long event as well, but it's every age and stage. We have couples that are thinking about getting married, you know, that are on the edge of commitment uh, to uh, couples that have been married for decades. And we've written, you know, the, this book that you're referring to, Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, where we talk about the myths of marriage and some of these things uh, is obviously pretty 
pointed toward that that time frame of pre-marriage and the early years of marriage. But we've written a lot of books uh, for every age and stage, and um, and that fight night is built on the book that we call uh, the Good Fight. There's, there's good fights and there's bad fights. And if you have a good fight, it'll actually bring you together. But uh, oh, I guess I should ask you right now then: what constitutes a good fight? <laughs> <laughs> Well, a good fight it results in deeper intimacy, ultimately. That's the quick answer. But a, a good fight is also one that uh, allows both parties to be heard. Um, you know, here in Seattle, where, where we live and work, um, just across the canal out our office windows, uh, John Gottman did his famous work in the, in the Love Lab. And uh, so we write on his coattails of research on that front. Uh, in understanding what constitutes a good fight and avoiding the the four horsemen and the apocalypse yep. as he calls yep. them and, and all that. But uh, one thing we know is that conflict, a, a good fight can actually bring you together. And so you have to distinguish between a good fight and a bad fight. A bad fight pulls you apart. And so uh, when, when we talk about fighting and we talk about conflict, uh, we want to major on uh, having a good fight uh, that allows you to recognize this person that I'm fighting with is not the enemy, right? It's the issue <laughs> that we're having problems with. And that's the starting place for that. And another ingredient of a good fight has to do with um, um, uh, empathy, that capacity to put yourself in the other person's shoes. In fact, uh, that's one of the main strings on our guitar. We are are continually... Uh, really focused on the capacity for empathy. We wrote a book a few years ago called Trading Places that is all about that. And um, if that's the only kind of tool you can pull off the proverbial shelf mm -hmm. in the midst of a conflict, it's typically enough to ameliorate all the tension and allow the two of you to get more sane and turn whatever conflict you're having into a good fight that actually brings you closer together rather than farther apart. Awesome. Okay. So I'm going to go back just a minute now to when we're talking about the individual and I heard you describe that there are basically two aspects of self-awareness and that self-awareness is so key to being able to um, sustain a long-term relationship. You can stop me if I'm wrong. And that you were referring to two specific things and I can help you out there if you don't know exactly what uh, I'm referring you, to. referring to self-awareness and then the, the awareness yep. of your partner? Yeah. Well, yes, but then what makes up a person who's self-aware? You yeah. wrote. So lead me a little bit. Yeah, uh, you said um, the two things you said were authenticity mm. and self-giving love. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're phoning it in, uh, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't go very far, right? If you're just kind of going through the techniques and you're doing the, the motions, um, everyone has a built-in radar for phoniness. And so it has to be genuine. In fact, when we're teaching this, this principle, uh, we often will have, um, you know, our students in, in a class, we teach a, a course, Marriage 101, that ended up being the most popular course on our campus, pack out the, the, the lecture hall uh, every Monday night for three hours. And we were always given an assignment. Hey, sometime this next week, go into the dining hall and muster up your courage, sit down with a, a group of people that you don't know very well at one of the round tables in the dining hall and do nothing but clarify content and reflect feelings, right? And when you begin to do that, you will be amazed at how that opens up another person's spirit. It's just incredible, right? If someone feels like you are with them in that moment um, and you are clarifying to make sure you accurately understand what they're saying, right? That's mm -hmm. clarifying content. And then reflecting back their feeling, which means I understand you at the deepest level I can in this conversation. Well, you begin to open up a, a person's spirit like never before. And uh, of course, that's a great road, you know, an, an on-ramp to, to empathy as well. So that's vital. And it, it has to come from a genuine heart. You can't just go through the motions. You know, I think it was George Burns that told a group of acting students uh, that once you can fake it, uh, you know, once you can just kind of um, go through the motions, you, you've got it made. You can't do that. You, you, you have to have your heart in it or it doesn't work. Does that yeah, make sense? People, yeah, people pick up on authenticity very well. I think that humans just, they know whether yeah. or not you're real. But, I mean, that's yeah, just what Even it comes subtle down. things like your pupils dilate. You, when you're genuinely interested yeah. in 
And we don't go around looking each other's eyes and go, hey, are your pupils dilated or not? But we pick that up at an unconscious mm-hmm. level. And so it's those kinds of things that are so vital to making Absolutely. sure somebody feels understood. Okay. I want to get to something very specific that really piqued my interest that um, you talked about in this other podcast about this book regarding a University of Chicago study about the five attitudes young people between the ages of 13 and 35 have toward marriage. And I tuned into that because that's, as a marriage and relationship coach, I deal with this in both my writing and in my coaching all the time that, and I express this as best as I can, that at the end of the day, your attitude and your mindset is the key ingredient for your success, both in in life and in love. And those attitudes that you describe, we're going to go through, I'm going to have you go through them, to me just spoke volumes about where the person's head is when they're entering a relationship and what's going to happen as a result of the way they think about it. Yeah, what we call the marriage mindset is is so, and this comes out of research that we did with some folks at the University of Chicago, and it's so incredibly important because it has nothing to do with the other person at this stage. It's everything about you and your mindset that you're bringing into the relationship. And so in our research with that team, we identified these five, these five mindsets. And uh, I know later on here, we're going to talk a little bit about the assessment that can help you pinpoint actually uh, which one you have, but they're, they're relatively easy to remember because they all start with R. I'll just list them off. Resolute, rational, romantic, restless and reluctant. Uh, Everybody that gets married, and we know this from research, at least between the ages of 18 and 36 or something like that in our studies, uh, will fall into one of these camps pretty cleanly. And so resolute, rational, romantic, restless, and reluctant. Is this what you're referring to? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So you want to want to knock these down? Yep. Resolute. Okay, so Resolute, this is the person that has always dreamed of being married. This is a part of their life plan. They can't imagine not being married. It's uh, something that um, <clears throat> they've kind of been planning for their whole life. Uh, divorce is not in their vocabulary. They haven't even thought that that could ever occur in their life. And so they are resolute about marriage. The next one is rational. I'm going to kind of jump to these quickly because we could spend okay. the whole hour talking about these. Rational. Uh, this is the person, <clears throat> and again, we're talking about mindsets, right? Not, right. not a relationship dynamic, right. but attitudinal set you bring into the relationship. And so mindset uh, here, if it's rational, this is the person that has a little skepticism about marriage. Uh, they will tend to get married later in life, uh, but they still believe it, it's, it's possible. They've probably come from a home where they saw a pretty poor example of how to be married. And so they're very rational and they will, they will date and, and be engaged for longer periods of time than most people uh, because of that. But they still believe in, in the idea of, of lifelong love and of marriage. So it's the rational mindset. And then you have the third one. So we have resolute, rational. And then the third one is romantic. And this person... Well, um, <laughs> this is always an interesting one when they walk into your counseling office because they, can't, they don't believe you can really understand their experience because they have fallen in, a love, in love in a way that nobody on the planet has ever experienced love. And so this person is, uh, <laughs> you know, just... Um, just Convinced she's to- fallen upon something that no one else has seen or experienced. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've discovered romantic love. And it's and always I'm- a woman, less, right? It's well, always a woman. <laughs> I will tell you, we know from research that it is about 60-40, 60, 40, 60 okay. <laughs> women, 40% men that will fall into this attitudinal set toward marriage. And so uh, they, they don't believe that you can really understand love at the level that they do. And, and this is the kind of love that nobody's ever had before. And so that's, that presents a, a whole unique set of clinical issues, of course. And then we go from there to restless. So resolute, rational, romantic, and then restless. Now, these people uh, really don't, uh, they're not thinking much about marriage at all. Th- this is the person that is thinking about what is going to be fun to do this afternoon, uh, you know, and so they're not thinking about long term stuff and they just want to have fun right now. I kind of uh, liken it to, uh, if you remember the MTV show uh, uh, Jersey Short, right? It was just, it's what's happening right now and where's the party and let's have a good time. 
I'm not thinking about planning my life and certainly not lifelong love in a marriage relationship. And so these people only end up in your counseling office doing pre-marriage work with you if some something has happened, somebody you know has gotten pregnant or uh, or some other legal issue has come up or something, and they feel like they're kind of forced to face marriage when they really weren't quite ready for it. And then the last category after restless is reluctant. And these people don't believe in marriage at all. It's just a certificate. It's a piece of paper. Why would I need a piece of paper to be in love with you? And so these people only end up in your counseling office for pre-marriage counseling because their partner wants to get married. Mm -hmm. And so that's the only reason that happens, right? So resolute, rational, romantic, restless, and reluctant. Make sense? yeah, and you have some um, you have some research there on the percentages of their, you know who has a better or less or more chance of divorce, right? Yeah, we know a ton about each one of these and lots of demographic stuff, and that's why I wanted to skate over the, yeah, the surface yeah. of them pretty quickly, and, and and we can drill down on any of them. But uh, uh, resolute people have generally that's the first one. These are the true believers in marriage, right? That, that marriage is going to be for, for life. And I, I can't imagine it not being that way. And I know it's built on commitment, but I, I, I have these feelings too. And they have these twin engines of the commitment, the cerebral part and the emotional part. Yeah. And they typically come from homes where they saw pretty decent examples of marriage. And so when they get married, it's for life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that, that, that's uh, really coming from a home that is, is rel- rel- you know, relatively healthy, looking at across the spectrum at others. Now the rational, they typically come from homes where they saw not very good examples of marriage. Um, They saw glimpses of it, which makes them a believer, but they're not true believers like Mm. the resolute person. They see marriage as something they desire. It's valuable, but man, it can be like walking a tightrope and it's scary. And Mm -hmm. so you got to make sure that you're prepared and um, and doing the right things. I wonder so, if most people don't fall into that category somehow in my head. Well, that no, what, seems. What's interesting is almost an equal distribution. The 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 category that has the most is actually the the resolute the resolute rational and romantic. Those three restless and reluctant has the least. And I don't have the percentages in front of me. You might have those, but uh, but I'm doing this off the top of my head. And so, uh, but I I do know. The, the rational will take more time getting married because they've seen examples of how it doesn't work. Yeah. And so they're more intentional about it for sure. They'll date longer. Um, they will sometimes cohabit uh, more, uh, more likely to do that than other couples because they see that as a, as a viable test run for marriage. Uh, and we can talk about that too. The research is pretty mixed on, on using mm-hmm. habitation as a good launching pad for marriage. Um, and, and then you have the, the romantic that just believes there's never been a love like the love I'm having right now. And so nobody can really understand me. And you, like I said, you have a, a little more female than male on that side. And those people do not have as high of success rate. They, they certainly can have lifelong love in marriage, uh, but they, they tend to have a, a, a slightly higher divorce rate than others. And so, yeah, lots of interesting demographics. Yeah each one of them. Okay. So let's talk about the effectiveness since we're talking about saving your marriage before it starts and really honing in on that as a piece to this conversation. Let's talk about the significance of, or the effectiveness, I should say, of premarital counseling, which I think is something that does not get enough attention. And I also think that the, you know, unless you are specifically uh, inclined toward that because maybe you come from a more religious family or your community is just more involved in that somehow through your church, um, that people don't even consider this as an option or, or much less get any sort of counsel on the fact that that's a good thing to do and that it's very, very helpful. I don't know how it is in Seattle, but I just feel like it's almost a non-issue. And I think that's really unfortunate because it's a little bit of a goldmine to do it, don't you think? Yeah, it is. It's, uh, and, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been to wedding shows and, and had, you know, a booth set up saving your marriage before it starts. And, and it sometimes is so startling to see people because they're so focused on the ceremony and then they see a little booth that's all about the relationship. And sometimes the reaction is to laugh, like, why would you guys be here? Uh, the other is, oh my goodness, I'm so glad you're here. And others just kind of scratch their head, like, what's going on? And, and, and so we put so much emphasis 
on preparing for life. I, I mean, for preparing for marriage that we don't necessarily prepare for lifelong love. And the research is very clear that we can do things. We know that you can increase the level of satisfaction and fulfillment and the commitment, the stick by at least 31% if you have effective uh, pre-marriage work on the front end. Now that's pretty good, right? Yeah, you that's extremely good. Of course, by 31%, pretty remarkable. And so who wouldn't want that? And it doesn't take much. You know, we're talking about uh, maybe five or six hours of meeting with a, a counselor. And, um, and as you know, we have an assessment that does that. There's other tools out there like Prepare and Rich. And when you do that, you're, you're pretty much, it's like insurance. I just don't know why anyone wouldn't want to get, you know, pre-marriage help on the front end, you know. Agreed. And, it's just such good insurance. And, and you wouldn't just start driving a car without somebody teaching it to, to do that. Why would you think that? My husband you, says that all the time. And he's got this great theory that we have to force this and make everybody do this. That way there'll be fewer divorces, <laughs> which of course you can't do. But theoretically, it's nice, I suppose. It's true. Yeah. It's so true. You know, we, years ago, Leslie and I got invited by the governor of Oklahoma. Um, this is over 10 years ago now to uh, move from our home city of Seattle, where we, you know, teach and work and, and everything else, and, and to move to Oklahoma from Seattle for 12 months to work on the first ever statewide marriage initiative. And um, be, in why Oklahoma? Because at the time, they have the highest divorce rate in the country, and they still have one of the highest, highest divorce rate. And, and it's, it, part of that is because um, they think, uh, I, I don't need any help, right? I'm in love, right? And, and in many cases, they're in the buckle of the Bible belt. Uh, God's on our side. And so what, we don't need any pre-marriage counseling, right? We just jump into it. And uh, the truth is, there's some skills that you can get a hold of. There's some self-awareness. There's some tools. If you bring into that relationship, it can increase your level of satisfaction, not just you know keep you from running into the potential for divorce, but make your life so much happier if you understand the tools that you can use. And so uh, it's, been, it's been interesting to see that kind of seep out beyond just Oklahoma and down into Texas and other places where they, at the time, began to make that an option for people to get a discount on their marriage license if they would get pre-marriage help. Yes, so, yes. Wait, I think yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. The person who, I think I've been emailing with the person who put that into action. I don't know what I'm thinking of. It was Governor Keating, it was his well, initi initiative. And but oh. um, there's other people, Mary Myrick, and there's a whole team of folks that uh, we worked with. So we moved to Oklahoma from Seattle, which, by the way, is not uh, our first choice to move from our lovely Emerald City here. <laughs> where we live, but we moved there, but uh, we did it because we believed in the in the cause, and it's just been so fascinating to see what you can do to actually move that needle on uh, divorce, help people. You know, most people don't know, for example, if you will um, uh, know this person for at least two years before you get married, your yep. chances of divorce go way down. We just look at all the indicators of, of what predicts divorce, mm -hmm. right? And, if, and they're not that difficult, right? If you can just do those things, you increase your level of satisfaction. Now, that might mean, hey, you got a little heartbreak because maybe this person isn't for you. I, um, I've often thought that's part of the issue with premarital counseling is that people in their minds, because there's so much in that state of love or yeah. in being in love, that they don't want to hear whatever could potentially cause them to not get married. What are your thoughts right. on that? And what yeah. separates the person who's willing to do that versus not? Yeah. It, you know, we have this little phrase in psychology, awareness is curative, right? Awareness is curative. If you know about something, then you can do something about it. And, um, some people, you know, just ignorance is bliss. We hear that all the time, right? And so I don't, I don't want you to come into this relationship and hold up a mirror and, yeah. and show me that I have work to do. It's kind of like, you know, I, we have, Leslie and I have a, uh, two boys and uh, one of them is uh, just uh, kind of a neat freak and his room is always immaculate. And the other uh, in high school, his room is just a mess. He's a, he's a, voracious reader. He has stacks of books everywhere, has his electric guitar over here, his acoustic guitar over here, and there's leaves that he collected on it. You know, it's just like yeah. kind of chaos yeah. in his room. And I walked into his room a few nights ago and I said, Jackson, this room is nutty. It's crazy in here. And, and, he, and he's laying on his bed reading. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, don't you think it's kind of a mess? He goes, oh yeah, I, I guess it is. You know, he's looking around. 
And it's that awareness that goes on. You go, oh, I guess I should maybe do something about it. I'll pick up some of these clothes that are on the floor, right? And and it's the same way when you have some kind of help uh, in your marriage relationship that you kind of hold up the proverbial mirror and become aware. And like we say, awareness is curative. So that's the the first step when you get to a place. And and that's why our Simbus assessment is so helpful because it takes a really, it's like looking in a mirror uh, that's all around you. Let's talk about that really quickly because I don't think I've said that yet. So the Simbus, it's S-Y-M-B-I-S.com, correct? It has its own site, which is also the title of the book, but it has its own site. And what will people do when they arrive at that site? Yeah, so the Simba, so that stands for Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, which is the name of, of the book. And uh, that book has been used by more than 2 million couples on the front end of marriage. And uh, it's been around for a few years. And uh, we, um, I don't know if, if uh, you mentioned this in the intro, but, but Leslie and I were on the front end of uh, launching eHarmony, the online matching. Oh. And, um, and so we, we learned, you know, from this was 20 more than 20 years ago that we launched eHarmony with Neil Clark Warren and a psychologist and the guy you uh-huh. used to see in the commercials, if you remember on TV. And uh, what we discovered is that, you know, there, there truly is a science to this, right? Uh, we, c- we know what can predict your chances of success in a relationship. Part of it has to do with matching well. And that's what that was all about. The very first online matching, uh, you know, system. And, um, and, and by the way, the, the divorce rate, uh, we drove down for couples that matched on that site to less than 3%. Pretty incredible, right? Yeah, that's pretty incredible. So, so then uh, what we wanted to do is take the next step and design a, uh, an assessment tool that couples can use once they find the love of their life and talk about the match between them and leverage that. And, and here's the good news in case somebody's listening to us going, oh, that's the last thing I want to do is take that because it might tell me we're a bad, bad match. Yeah. No, it doesn't tell you that at all. Whatever your match is, it's going to show you how to make that, how to leverage that to have the best relationship that you can have. So it takes about uh, um, 30 minutes for each person to answer their set of questions, and then they debrief it with one of our trained uh, Symbus facilitators. We call that S-Y-M-B-I-S, Symbus, saving your marriage before it starts. And we have tens of thousands of trained psychologists and clergy and um, people in the military that are chaplains and so forth, Symbus facilitators, that will unpack that report. So you answer these questions and it generates this 15-page report that gives you all kinds of information that you couldn't have otherwise because there's magic in the technology behind the the scenes. So it's not just answering questions, yes or no, and so forth. It's it's pretty sophisticated. And that's been, I, I think, one of the greatest uh, contributions that we've made in our, our professional lives to couples is to be able to um, give them that opportunity to go online, answer yeah. these questions, and generate some magic. You know, I just had an idea, it just occurred to me now, that parents, before they pay for the wedding, yeah. <laughs> should require... And demand mm-hmm. that they have to go to Sims. To, I'm not saying that right. Sims, yes, yeah. Sims um, yeah. and do that before they'll pay for it. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're speaking my language. I mean, <laughs> we we know that it would uh, lower the divorce rate by at least 31 percent based on conservative uh, research studies. And so uh, I'm always amazed. Like, why wouldn't yeah, you want to? Yeah, you exactly. Know? And it just it it makes you know it just makes the road smoother. Who wouldn't want to travel on a smoother road? I don't and, know. Uh, Tell me. Oh. The, the challenge for some is that, that, oh, maybe I'll learn something I don't want to learn or, yeah. or, or maybe, you know, but that's the whole point is awareness is curative. Once you become aware of something, then you can do something about it. And, and I can actually vouch for this less. So I've been married for 22 years, but prior to that, I was married and divorced, no kids, four years in my 20s. And I remember my mother wanting us to go to premarital counseling. And we both adamantly refused, although we ended up finally going to see someone for maybe 30 minutes Mm -hmm. and just gave it absolutely nothing. Like, why are we here? This is ridiculous. Basically, everything you're describing um, about that attitude of not, you know, uh, not, not wanting to know anything and not thinking that there was anything to teach us. And of course, four years later, we're divorced. Um, so I can vouch for it personally, for sure. Well, and I, and you're certainly not alone. I appreciate that. The, 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 you know, all you need is love, right? The Beatles yeah, right. <laughs> and, and so we, we kind of, we, we literally have this neuro 
chemical shower that happens in our brain when we're falling in love and, and we're getting married and, and all of that. And we distance, we, we don't have that capacity to, to get objective because we're, yeah. just, we're just in a whirl of emotions, especially in, in, in the younger stage of our lives. And so it's understandable that people would feel like that. And, and especially if, if one of you is a romantic and nobody's ever experienced this love before. Oh, sure. Everybody else has problems, but not, they don't know this yep. kind of love. Yep. And so uh, if you can take a couple, wh- wherever they are, and give them five hours to unpack this Simbus mm-hmm. report, we know it lowers their chances of divorce by at least 31%, and it increases their level of contentment and happiness and satisfaction by at least a third. And who wouldn't want that? I it's painless, That's, by the way. Yeah. You know, in, in, unless you, you really have a deficit, and, and there is a page of, of the report, we call it well-being, and the premise of that page is that your marriage can only be as healthy as, as the two of you, which we mm-hmm. touched on earlier. Um, but it's, it's literally just kind of helping couples look in the mirror, become more self-aware, so then they can take action on things, improve their communication, learn how to manage conflict, uh, bridge the, the proverbial gender gap, and, and all the rest. And who wouldn't want that? Who, if I you're don't know. A hike through the, the Swiss Alps, wouldn't you want to write the right tools to, to make that trip as easy as it can be? Well, so. I don't in why we don't do that with marriage. You speaking of the brain shower, the chemical brain shower, that made me think of this last thing I wanted to ask you about, which I think is on Simbus.com. And that's the three ingredients of romantic love. And one of yeah. them, you when you, I heard you talk about it before, we talked about where people get stuck because it's fluid, but we'll, we'll get to that. So what are those, what is that triangular theory? And then let's talk about what yeah. each thing is. Yeah. This this comes out of research that Robert Sternberg did at Yale University um, man at, at, almost 30 years ago now, Um, but looking at the ingredients of romantic love. And, uh, you know, that's not a thing that uh, even romantics are are inclined to do. They just know I'm in love, right? And they have this brain shower of these incredible chemicals. It feels great. And, but when uh, Robert Sternberg came along, he did this incredible study looking at what, what are the ingredients? If you were to design a recipe for romantic love, what would go into it? And what he came up with is something that he calls the triangular theory of love, which I know sounds like a major sleeper, but it's not. It's super practical. Just picture a triangle in your mind's eye. And on one side of it, you have the word passion. This is the biological side of love. This is the thing that starts love. This is the thing that gets love going. It's, it's what you see that person across the room and something just kind of clicks. Like go, the chemistry, you mean? Yeah, chemistry? I like that. Yeah. that person, right? So passion is the biological side of love. On the other side of of that triangle, you can write the word intimacy. And intimacy is the emotional side, not the biological, but the emotional side of love. And this is that part of love that typically grows deeper over time because you you learn things about each other and there's a connection and there's a sense that you get me and I get you like nobody else on the planet, right? That's a wonderful experience, right? Yeah, it is. And so- When you feel like you've known them forever. That's Absolutely. what I would, yeah, yeah. And, and nobody's known me like you've known mm-hmm. me and vice versa. That's a wonderful thing. Um, and then on the base of the triangle is, is commitment. And that is the willful side. So you have passion, that's biological. And then you have uh, intimacy, which is emotional. And then on the base of the triangle, you have commitment, which is willful. And this is that part of love that truly is a decision. This is that part of love that says, in spite of all the uncertainty in my life, in spite of all the things that swirl about me that I can't quite pin down, I'm going to make one thing rock solid, and that's my relationship with you. Now, that doesn't come from your emotions, right? That doesn't come from your biology. That comes from your, your brain. That comes yeah. from your capacity to make a decision. So those are the three ingredients of romantic love, passion, intimacy, and commitment. But the bottom line of Sternberg's research at Yale was not just to identify those, but it was to also show us that those ingredients are very, very fluid. They change. They're not static. You don't fall in love and fall out of love. Love changes. And so that, that passion level, if you've been married for more than a minute, you know that that changes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes you have great passion and sometimes it feels like I don't have any passion at all because right. I'm preoccupied with this crisis at work or whatever. Yep. And then you have uh, the emotional side of love, passion, and then there's intimacy. And sometimes intimacy, it feels like nobody knows me 
on this earth like you do. You just know me so well. And then there's other times with my wife, Leslie, who we've been married for more than three decades, and I wonder, does she even know me? How could she have thought that? Of course I wasn't thinking that, right? And so, uh, and then- This even- is so important, what you're saying right now, Les, this whole fluidity issue. Keep going. This is just oh, really critical. It's such a good insight, especially on the front end of marriage. And then on the base of that, you know, commitment, we think, well, of course, that's just a decision. So either you have commitment or you don't. But no, there's an energy level that goes into that commitment. And there's times where uh, that commitment is, you're in full focus, right? I am all about this. But then there's other times you get distracted because uh, you have an illness or uh, a child that you you guys have in your family is having problems or there's a difficult situation at work or what have Just you. stressors, life stressors. Yeah. Or yeah. there's a pandemic, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so you have... Uh, fluidity in all three of these. In fact, the bottom line of Sternberg's research in all of this was to to say that love is very, very fluid. It's not a static thing that you fall into and you fall out of. It changes. There's an ebb and flow to it. And these three ingredients can change. And even the commitment level can change. Now, you might have the big check marks in that box. Yes, I'm committed to you. But there's an energy level in that commitment that wanes, that comes and goes, right? And so when you understand that love is very, very fluid, then you recognize, okay, so passion, intimacy, and commitment, if these are the three ingredients of romantic love, when it feels like they're waning, at least we know what to work on, right? And so that's why we devote a whole chapter to it in Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts, because there's, there's certain things you can do to cultivate more passion. There's certain things to do to cultivate more intimacy and yes. more Right. And that's what made me think of the brain shower because you were talking about how if you, and I, this is so important, if you date, you, that you can get back that feeling. Well, first of all, let me back up and say, I think a lot of young people today struggle with what you just said, or at least they're not aware of it because they think you either feel it based on what they see in you know, TV or whatever, or you don't. And if you're not feeling it, then you, I guess the relationship's over, it's not working. And then they right. you know, go there. That's why what you're saying is so critical. But not only will it ebb and flow, but also that you can bring back those romantic feelings from the early days yeah. in your relationship, even years down the road. And I'll just give a quick example. When, you, when you're having kids, it changes everything with respect, with respect to the romantic piece because you're no longer in a quiet space where you can do whatever you want, both physically and, and verbally and all the rest, because you've got these children in your midst. And then if you, but if you remove yourself from that, if you, let's say you go away for a weekend, right, to a hotel with your spouse, all of a sudden, hopefully, you will immediately feel if you're um, exercising that muscle, that romantic muscle, you're going to feel it again when you remove those, well, I won't call kids stressors, but I mean, you can be stressors, but just regular life and go back to that space where you were at the beginning. It, it actually can happen. That's true. And, and I will qualify what you said just a little bit, because one of the things we know for research for the woman, the new mom, you know, yeah. I'm talking about the first couple of years, yeah. even going away on a getaway romantic weekend, she can have a difficult time being fully present. For sure. For sure. In for those early years, for sure. There. Now the guy, the husband, he has no problem doing that day or <laughs> night, true. any time. No question. And so it's typically, once the baby comes on the scene, it's typically the guy that feels left out. We know this from research, yep. especially research at the University of Washington that showed this time and again. And so you feel that the husband feels like a third wheel in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And, and especially if they're not active in the, the baby, you know, uh, taking care of the baby yep. on, a, on a daily basis. And so anyway, but yes, you're exactly right. And you can do things intentionally that, that bring back that love and feeling, right? The, yep. As the song says, bring back that love and feeling. And, and, but it, it has to be intentional. And, and by the way, it's not just when a baby appears either, right? Because no. careers sometimes. Yes, right. Baby, yeah. Right? Or life hobby. or deaths or, I mean, pe- yeah, absolutely. And so you can't, that whatever you were experiencing in those, in that when you were first meeting, you, you know how the whole world ends. I mean, not end, the whole world stops when you meet someone, right? And yeah. all of a sudden, it's just that person for those months. Right. So, so obviously, once you throw life into it, those feelings are going to, you know, like we said, ebb and flow. But, yeah. but the, to know that you can bring them back, I think that's just really, really and important. Just, and just that insight to know that the emotions of love ebb and flow mm-hmm. uh, is so 
such an insight for so many couples because they think, oh, yep. romantic love is supposed to be at a 10 out of 10 or else we got problems yep. all the time, 24-7, 365, right? We've got problems if it doesn't happen. And that's just not the case. Love is very, very fluid. There's an ebb and flow to it that is so natural. And there's things that you can do deliberately to cultivate that. And so uh, beginning with just self-awareness, real, having this insight that we're talking about. Definitely. Okay. Before I let you go, I want to talk about betterlove.com. You said you wanted to, to, yeah, so, I didn't know exactly um, what that was. So let's see. Yeah. So here's the, the deal with uh, the Symbus assessment that we touched on. Um, that's saving your marriage before it starts. S Y M B I S Symbus.com. If, if somebody goes there, if they're listening to us and they go, Oh yeah, I'd love to take that assessment. And uh, they go there. Um, they have to have a counselor uh, to walk through that with them. That is how that is constructed. We had such a demand from people that said, hey, I want to take this, but I don't want to go see a counselor. And so we created a kind of a light version, as it were, that we call Better Love. You can go to betterlove.com. And instead of being 15 pages, it's 10 pages. Instead of taking a half hour to answer all the questions, it takes about 10 minutes to answer all the questions. It comes with a little 20-page uh, action plan uh, specific for the two of you. And I got to tell you, during this pandemic, uh, there has been such a skyrocketing use of that because it's created a, a way for couples to date within the, the four walls of their home uh, when it may not be safe to go to their favorite restaurant or out to their favorite yeah. places and socialize because we create these four date nights out of it. So it's betterlove.com. And same thing, you go through, you answer a series of questions, takes about 10 minutes, you each do that separately. And here's the good news. Um, and no counselor, you said. No counselor. No counselor. You don't have a facilitator to unpack it. Okay. It's all self-guided and it's all upbeat. And that's an important thing for couples to know. This is not going to uncover something for you that you go, oh my goodness, why did we ever take this thing? Now we're dealing with Why did we ever get married? <laughs> <laughs> right. <No. laughs> it's not that kind of a tool. It's all the emphasis is on the positive. And so it's don't you don't have to be afraid it's going to kind of dredge up stuff that you've tried to bury over the years. It's going to help you maximize your love life. And so it goes through, you know, personality. It's the only assessment in the world, Symbus in this, that will look at your two personalities and flesh them out uh, and then show you how you dance together with these two unique personalities. You know, there's never been a marriage like yours before. And there never will be again. You take two unique individuals and you create a unique relationship. And that's why there's power. And, you know, a self-help book can be great on relationships, but it speaks in general terms. It has to because we're, you know, Mm -hmm. and so this is a way to really get into the story of your specific relationship. And so people can go to betterlove.com. It costs $35. It's not going to break the bank. And that's all it is. And, um, and it's, it's fun. The response we get is, oh, this has created some really fun date nights for us. Oh, awesome. Love it. Oh my gosh. So that's a couple of websites. We have Sim, Symbis, S-Y-M-B-I-S.com is one. Yeah. And then betterlove.com is another. And then just to add it, I'm going to have you now tell everybody where they can find you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, lessandlesley.com is our website. Uh, you can just Google our names, uh, Less and Leslie, and you'll find it. But uh, um, we, it is crazy, but we do have the exact same name. I have some differentiation by just going short my name to less, but less and Leslie.com. But you don't ever call her less then? Oh yeah. And, and you do, and vice versa. but we understand, you know, it's just sure. the two of us, right. But if somebody else is in the conversation, it can get confusing for them. So, and especially if, if, uh, you know, when I have dad and grandfather around, that's when it really used to get confusing. So I guess you didn't name either of your sons, Leslie. John, <laughs> but it's John Leslie. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't want anybody to feel left out. And then his younger brother, Jackson Leslie. So, uh, Oh, wow. Okay. It's the Leslie family. <laughs> That's awesome. This has been great, Les. I really appreciate your coming on. Um, this is very, very, very informative. My, my listeners are going to love it. Um, I especially love that, um, that specific those, those five things that you found, I think that is just really significant for people to understand that what they bring to the table mindset wise can actually make or break the success of their relationship. And I believe that very strongly. So if you're coming in really negative and you don't believe in it, you're going to have a really hard time doing it well, obviously. I mean, that's just common sense. 
Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, you got the message. It's been an yep. honor to be with you on this program. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Les. Hope to, uh, hope to see you again in the future soon. Thanks for your time. You bet. Take care. When you got married, things were perfect. You were both in love and life was good. Then somewhere along the line, everything changed. She changed, or maybe he did. Either which way, now your relationship feels, well, hard. I coach husbands and wives who feel lonely, disrespected, or misunderstood in their relationship. So many women today are desperate for their husbands to step up to the plate, to make a decision and to stick to it, to lead rather than to follow. Ladies, you have the power to make it happen. Men respond best to women who are grounded in their feminine core. As for husbands, so many of them want their wives to stop nagging and to just trust them, to smile more and to complain less, to look at them the way they did when they were first dating. Men, you have the power to make it happen. Women respond best to men who are grounded in their masculine core. The secret to lasting love rests in the masculine-feminine dance. Once you master it, your relationship will no longer be difficult. You'll be moving with the biological tide rather than against it. And that makes marriage smooth sailing. If you're struggling in your relationship, if you feel frustrated or alone, I can help. Just go to SuzanneVenker.com, that's S-U-Z-A-N-N-E-V-E-N-K-E-R.com, and click on the coaching button at the top. Don't wait another minute to acquire the mindset you need to find love and to sustain it. It's so much easier than you think. That's SuzanneVenker.com. And the email of the day is from Jenna. Hi, Suzanne, or Gina, maybe Gina, Gina or Jenna. Hi, Suzanne, my name is Gina. This weekend, I came across your appearance on Michaela Peterson's podcast and sub- subsequently got the Alpha Female's Guide to Men and Marriage and went on an enjoyable rabbit hole of your work. Thank you, by the way. I have a personal scenario that I'm, I have a personal scenario that I'm hoping you can provide some insight on. I, like much of your audience, am one of these headstrong type A women who struggles to reconcile that aspect of my personality with my true feminine nature in my romantic relationship. I notice it's much more evident in moments of high anxiety because I go into a more aggressive, worrying, problem-solving, or masculine mode, and I've seen how it can make my partner feel like what he's done to help the situation isn't enough, which only causes a rift emotionally and physically. How can I still be feminine and allow my partner to show up when I'm feeling anxious and out of control, given my personality? So I'm not going to be able to answer that in a quick, in a quick way for the simple reason that that is precisely what my coaching is about. So that's a big question. And it's, it's, as you pointed out, Gina, the thesis of the alpha females guide, it's also a component of how to be a wife my more recent ebook. And basically what you're touching on is exactly what I work with women about with women on every day in my coaching. So it's all about learning these specific skills that work to essentially bring out the best in your man that any woman can use, but women like yourself, the way you've described yourself, which I wholeheartedly identify with struggle more than someone who's simply not that way, right? Who's got a different, more um, lack, more, I would say lackadaisical, but more laid back, let's say, um, personality. So it's, it's, it's very much about not, it, the goal isn't to get rid of your personality, it's to channel it properly so that it works for you and not against you in your relationship. And essentially saying that, look, the, what you do during the day, how you behave during the day cannot just be transferred over to your love relationship or your marriage, because it just doesn't work. Those are different sets of skills that you're going to need doing one thing versus the other. So um, anyway, long, you know, big answer to that is, <laughs> um, is, is, I mean, the, the, the shorter answer to that is read the book, which you already did, which the Alpha Females Guide is all about. But also, if you're still needing help, and usually women do, it's not like they can read these books and just say, oh, okay, that's it, it's done. You're supposed to use it as a handbook and then essentially come to me for coaching when you need help, which most people do, to have their sort of hand held along the way so that I can be your guide as you're going along. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, we're talking about a very big shift in the way you communicate with your spouse that isn't something that comes naturally to you. And that does not happen overnight at all. So um, I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure it really does, except that it's just, I wanted to read that to everybody just to, 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 to express that that's literally what I do every day. And so um, it's just too big of a question to answer in a, in, in, in podcast, but to know that there is a way to learn how to do that, but that it takes time and focus 
and tremendous commitment. So hope that helps. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to tune in next week when we talk with John Gray, author of the most successful relationship book of all time, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, about how to marry the changes that have occurred with respect to gender roles with the biological differences between women and men. You do not want to miss that episode. Also, don't forget to continue the conversation on Facebook. Just type in The Suzanne Venker Show in the Facebook search bar and you will find it. Also, please recommend this podcast to one friend you think would enjoy it. And don't forget to leave us a review on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you have a question or comment for me, you can email me at Suzanne at the Suzanne Thanks for listening, everyone. Have a great week.